Hello, I'm Danny Morrison and welcome to a special edition of The Conversation where we take an alternative look at political events and current affairs around Ireland. My next guest is the author of a remarkably researched book which deals with the Algerian War of Independence and makes comparisons between Ireland and the subject of settler colonialism. It is also an important book in terms of how establishment media works and how the British media, which condemned the struggle for independence in Ireland, cheered on a much bloodier conflict in Algeria, which eventually led to Algerian independence. But before I go to my next guest, let's take a quick look at this week's topic. My next guest is none other than the author, Patrick Anderson. Pat, I'm going to call you Pat. Okay. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So you were a working class boy, grammar school boy. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your upbringing? Uh, Mom, I grew up in North Belfast, but went to school in West Belfast, uh, up the Glen Road. So I um, have a bit of a foot in both camps. So what was going on at the time up in Anderson's town. So I was there every day at school with my friends and then of course going back in the evening to North Belfast. So it gives you a good flavour of what was going on in the city at that time. Was there, was there many others in your family went to university? No, I'm the first one. Um, so uh, it was a bit of a story, me <laughs> going to university. Um, I went, I dropped out twice. I went to study auto engineering, went to study ecology and eventually ended up studying well, what would be called today PPE, politics, philosophy and economics, uh, but sort of make your way to it. Uh, well, what brought you on to the subject of Algeria? Well, it's, it's sort of curious in a way. I mean, you, you start read any politics, you start learning about colonialism and there's always, you know, small references to the French in North Africa. But also, you would always get, oh, it's not the same as here. I actually went along with that for the longest time, until I started, you know, the usual story. You read more, and you start asking another question. I got more interesting. Everybody started telling me, it's not the same. I believed them. These are people who were professors and teachers, and then you start reading again. You start asking different questions. And then you don't get the answer. Well, tell me, I mean, initially, when you came across the subject of French and Algeria, you saw comparisons between the British and Ireland. But give, us, uh, give our uh, viewers uh, a flavour of that conflict and how it came about. Well, the French-Algerian conflict is 1954 to 1962. In the French world, 
It is literally the biggest war of the 20th century, or we'll exclude the Second World War. It's like the Vietnam War in the English-speaking world. It's hugely bloody conflict from the French point of view. It's just across the water uh, to the, um, the Mediterranean. You could kick the boat off from Marseille and you get into North Africa. Just an unbelievably bloody struggle. The comparisons would seem really obvious and why it also concerned me. Why does everybody say it's not the same? You know, you have French settlers in North they're, Africa. They're there from the mid 19th century. That from the mid 19th century. So it's shorter than yeah. the, the length of time that the British are here. And that's always used that the French were there for such a shorter time. But it's actually a false um, denial, really, because the, the period of time that the French were there, there was a mass participatory French de democracy. And here they are in North Africa. Whereas the British in Ireland, it's a s slowly expanding oligarchic elite. So it's different. In, in other words, the saying that, that the British have been here longer denies the French being in uh, North Africa shorter, denies the analogy. In fact, it's the other way around. So they took over Algeria, mid 19th century, and in order to control it, they engaged in settler colonialism. Yeah, so they sent, it's, the, it, it's, it's a really good question that any settler colonialism is really different from colonialism. Settler colonialism is people call them settlers, call them migrants, it's always a contested label. They go to a different part of the world with the express intention of taking the land and settling. It's not like a colony where there's are administrators who just basically they're to extract, and they use local elites and help them. In a sense, you know, they're not as disruptive. They're robbing, of course, but it's just administrators from the imperial center, where settlers is an entirely different thing. They come with the intention of staying, which means they have to move people off the land, and then they have a difficult relationship well, was there, with the mother country. Was there initial resistance to the settler colonialism in Algeria? There was, of course, and uh, the French used, you know, no. All these countries who were settled by the Europeans, look, the Europeans were pretty good at organizing violence. That's the thing. The European armies, you could not, you could not stand up to them. All of these countries, and so the French army would have been the same. They imposed their will by military force. It's the same story that you know the French did everywhere or the British did everywhere around the world. Well, here in Ireland, of course, we've got lots of uh, examples of resistance to the British presence or the English presence initially. So when did really resistance take off in Algeria? Well, you know, pretty almost right away. And the, the, the French, of course, used the very same uh, tactics that the British would have done around the world, like scorched earth tactics. So you see, it's so hard for a, like a, the native population to resist that. These come in with organized force and like immediately after 1830 when the, when the French ar arrive, the big Algerian hero is a guy called Sheikh El Qadir, who in our terms today would, he would have been considered a jihadist from that time, but also he would have been a person who wanted to preserve like uh, human rights and lives and he tried to protect civilians really and he did some things in different in Damascus for example where he's really honored today but anyway he led a resistance against the French in the end the French prevail. So interestingly your PhD on the conflict in Algeria and the struggle for independence also took in a major part British media's response to that so what what did that tell you about the okay. situation? Yeah so that's a good question so really how I came to study French North Africa was through the study of Noam Chomsky. And Chomsky is the big media analyst. So, I mean, I had been involved in projects, different parts of the world, Angola, Mozambique, Central America. And then these are all, you know, modern day or had been, you know, problems. And Chomsky had written a lot on this. So I started to become quite familiar with Chomsky's work. And Chomsky's work had, you know, worked in explaining how different conflicts in the modern world had been propagated in the American media. And I thought, I should do this for 
Ireland. Because here I was abroad a lot, and it was people had such a poor idea of what went on in Ireland. Basically, it was a religious squabble. Mm -hmm. You and I know that's not the case, but it was so prevalent. I said, how, how can I bring this to people's attention? Chomsky. Now, one thing Chomsky's model really needs is a matched historic pair. Well, it seemed to me so obvious, French Algeria. So obvious that everybody told me, don't go there. But once you go, you can see that the similarities are just remarkable. So you adopted the PhD as a textbook mm -hmm. on Algeria and on the media. So what happened? What was the progress from, the, from there on? Uh, the first uh, publication was by Cork University Press, but it ran into uh, trouble with uh, the late journalist Henry MacDonald. Now, it would be true to say it doesn't come out of the book looking well, because this is a looking at people's journalistic output over a long period of time, and then I'm taking it apart because I'm putting it up against the historic record. He threatened uh, legal action, and uh, Cork University Press withdrew it. I told them, look, it would be impossible with his background for him to win the legal battle. Basically, you said he was associated with the Workers' Party, which he was, and he took exception to that. He took exception to that, and also a, another journalist joined him. And so the coordination of it made Cork run. But the other journalist, to his credit, immediately withdrew and apologised. Mm -hmm. But uh, sort of, it, it was hard to look on it as not like coordinated. So the book was basically... So the book was pulled then. And pulled. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, of course, where I have to declare an interest in that yeah. the, you brought to my attention yeah. and I helped edit it and, and get the book published. It was published uh, 18 months ago mm -hmm. and uh, was well received in many, many circles. I mean, you came across some very interesting research in terms of uh, people who were involved in our conflict here, but who were also, in a sense, cheerleaders uh, in the British media. If you look, this, this method of studying the, uh, the media is called the propaganda model. And people immediately say, oh, this is a conspiracy model. But I have to make it clear, it's not a conspiracy model at all. It's an extended, long, long extended look at the output of the media from one conflict and a very similar one, and you can compare them. So it's a huge, really, amount of work. Whether anyone is a propagandist or not, that's not the point. It's the point is looking at the final output and how did it get there. Now, you put forward explanations of how it may have happened, but really the point is, here's what did happen. Here's this output, and here's that output. Remarkably similar conflicts. How come this is the output here, and how come it's completely different here? And Chomsky's model is that the output will prioritise power, and so it does. And what about some of the personalities involved in both conflicts? Yeah. So for me then I had to look at people who had, you know, reported in Algeria and reported in the conflict in the north of Ireland. So that was sort of hard to find, but I eventually did find 10 people, which was great for me. So these people have actually eyewitnesses to the Algerian conflict and eyewitnesses in Ireland. And why they're so important is, what you learn is ideas that they have internalised. Now remember, I've got an advantage over them because I'm reading everything at the time. My advantage is they might know their little corner of the conflict, but I've looked at the whole lot. And most of them have internalised wrong ideas. I'll give you a small example. For these British journalists who had been in Algeria and the same in Ireland, they would always say to me, oh, Ireland is you know, not as bad as Algeria because of this incident called the Rue de Isley massacre, which is basically Bloody Sunday in Algeria. If you look at the figures for the Bloody the Sunday killings and the Rue de Isley, the Rue de Isley, there were more people killed, about 45. The difference is this. What happened on the Rue de Isley was the French soldiers opened fire for five, seven minutes. They opened fire, nine of them. Though eyewitnesses, these British journalists who were there, saw their officers slapping their faces to get them to stop. Bloody Sunday is different. There were less people killed, but 
behind it, there's a much more sinister thing going on. The uh, Ministry of Defense, they're making the soldiers go up on that day, filling their heads full of what they're going to do. So, it, okay, the numbers are smaller, but what happened in Algeria was a spontaneous, terrible event, Bloody Sunday, there's far more behind it. But nobody, these journalists all had it the other way around. What was the role? I mean, Conor Cruz O'Brien, who became Minister of Posts and Telegraphs yeah. in the Dublin government, mm -hmm. and who was instrumental in police and censorship with Section 31, what was his role in terms of uh, the coverage of Algeria? Yeah, so uh, uh, Conor Cruz O'Brien was a big sort of an expert. He sort of fell in love with Algeria. He worked in the French Embassy in Paris at the time, and so he had a lot to say on Algeria, and then wrote about Camus and their very famous books and everything. And basically, O'Brien himself acknowledges that he, he, he was a big advocate for the FLN who were like extremely ruthless, extremely ruthless. Not to me to deny these people their independence, but the FLN and the ALN themselves will acknowledge how ruthless they were. Conor Cruz O'Brien cheered them on. But O'Brien is important for us because O'Brien, his um, analysis of the conflict in the north of Ireland basically framed nearly all of the media analysis in the British media on Ireland. O'Brien, basically his ideas framed it all. To shorten it, it was a religious conflict, not the legacy of colonialism. The other way around in Algeria, Algeria was put, uh, written up as the classic anti-imperial war. There was, in fact, a great deal of a religious dimension behind it. So the two things are sort of stood on their head. And what about the uh, journalist John Cole, who was, he was from Belfast, he yeah. went, became a political correspondent yeah. in London. How, and how, did, how did he frame yeah. the presentation and the perception of our conflict here? So Cole is very much like uh, Conor Cruz O'Brien because he's a pivotal person in the presentation of the conflict in Ireland. He's the sort of in-house expert for the Guardian and Observer at the time. At the time, seen as, you know, the most left-wing and progressive uh, newspapers. But John Cole himself uh, would have been described in his uh, obituary as a true Protestant son of Belfast, meaning he was a real unionist. However, Merlin Rees, Reginald Maudling, Jim Callaghan, all of them went to him for advice. His view of the north of Ireland went in The, in the Guardian. So what, are, what other observations did you make? about the British media's role in our conflict here. O'Brien and Cole basically turned the Algerian analysis on its head. The Algerian conflict does have a religious dimension and an anti-imperial dimension, but it's portrayed as the classic anti-imperial struggle and the religious dimension is overlooked. Whereas in the north of Ireland, they boosted this religious angle and pushed aside almost entirely the legacy of colonialism. So they basically turned it on his head. But there were so many similarities. So sometimes the people who gave it away are very interesting. So for example, Noel Little, Emma Little, Pangeli's father, who's a gun runner. Now Emma, when he, they asked him, why did you do it? Very interestingly, he said, mm, to stop Britain doing in Algeria. I remember going, good man, Noel, you know what you're talking about. But everybody else denies it. But the French Parliament referred to Algeria as France's Ireland. Mm -hmm. They knew. And Harold Wilson, when his cabinet secretly discussed withdrawn. From the north. From the north, they discussed withdrawn under the code word Algeria. This is the place that everybody tells me it's not the same. And it, there were American academics who, when they first came over and recorded British soldiers here, they, I mean the officers now, they're all saying things like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, the French have been through all this in Algeria. All these things get written out of the media, but you see, I have the original ones. So you say, how do these things disappear? But then it gets even more interesting. Then you get Kitson himself, who quotes... Colonel Roger Trinquier, 
Now, Roger Trinquier was right at the heart of the Battle of Algiers, and he made no bones about it. You have to torture these guys to get information out of it. Now, not all the French officers w wanted to torture them, because a lot of them knew it, it doesn't work anyway. People are under torture. Tell you anything, anything yeah. you see. But Trinquier, he believed no torture them, and Kitchen quotes Trinquier. And so he followed Trinquier. But I mean, the similarities, Danny, are beyond belief. Lord Carrington, who, foreign, res foreign who foreign. resigned over the Falklands but didn't resign over torture. Now, we now know that Carrington signed off on, on the, on the torture. Men, yeah. At the time, we, we didn't know. But when the Compton inquiry went for, was first written on uh, the, the torture here in the north, Compton quotes almost verbatim Père de la Rue, who was the chaplain to the Al the paratroopers in Algiers. And his famous quote was, you have to do this. Don't take any joy out of it, but it's a necessity. And if you read through Compton, you go, I read this before. That's Père de la Rue. The similarities, but it goes even further than that. So if you, if you, there are more similarities. And it's the other way this time. It's the Algerians looking at Ireland. And the original uh, Algerian, the ALN, took their inspiration from Michael Collins, and, so, and they're as schoolboys. They're all going, this Michael Collins guy's great. These IRA guys are great. They get Ireland out from under, under Britain. And these are boys at school who grow up to be the leaders of the Algerian rising. So the, the Algerians are copying uh, the Irish and the, the British are copying the French in Algeria. Well, the thing is, of course, the, whenever the Gaul betrayed the army, so to speak, mm -hmm. there was a reaction against uh, the Gaul, you know, and the attempts, there was explosions and attempts of assassination, etc. But there was no similar thing here uh, in Britain by the army, apart from 1974, what's it called, Operation Clockwork Orange? Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, well, that's a really good example, Danny, because, you see, the French, in a sense, are way more honest than the British. There's a real political divide in France. So, and even the French officers, they like, debated in public about the torture. And you had other French officers say, no, we can't do that. It brings dishonor on the French army. So they are dis discussed. I'm not excusing the French. I'm just saying they're, they're open about it. Whereas the British, you know, we never tortured. We never tortured. It doesn't come out at all. So there was opposition to de Gaulle in the, in the French, but the, the British, army never got any opposition and the British army you know the like soldiers uh, would uh, sit down with the you know head of the opposition uh, they're, they're sort of they all went to school together in a sense mm -hmm. so there was never that real division that the French that the British army would be upset with their political leadership because the political leadership in Britain never went against the army mm -hmm. the army asked for it they got it do you know who we know, know who we can thank for that? Garrett Fitzgerald, because he's the one that told us. Just, when, when, the, when the British sit down with their generals, if the generals ask for it, they get it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's Garrett. He was in the IRA, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> His father was in the GPO. So it ends with the uh, decolonization of Algeria. It ends with the Piet Noir, the vast majority of them, going back to France. Mm -hmm. Here, the term settler colonialism is seen as pejorative and the unionists have taken exception to it even though in the past they have used the term. Well you're so right Danny and uh, I did face opposition from people saying to me you know this is a pejorative term against unionism. Look in academia it is not. It's an explanatory tool. So when we talk about the set settler colonialism what we're talking about is if you talk about colonialism, you're talking about an invasion. But settler colonialism is a structure. In other words, the invasion never stops. It just keeps on going. That is, you have a structure of displacing the people before. Now, that's been overturned quite a bit in, with the Good Friday Agreement. So this idea of being called a settler, you will get young progressive unionists today who, who find it 
you know, it, it's difficult if you're a young progressive unionist because of this colonial label hanging over them. And it sits uneasily of the shelf of uh, a liberal Protestant. But look, for the longest time, Paisley, for example, would have went on about his good settler stock. You know, it would have been an honorific in the mm -hmm. past. But after the Second World War, you know, if you're the colonist, basically, you're the bad guy. You're, you're the one that caused the trouble, not the guys who are fighting against you. In fact, it seems that the natives, if we call the Irish the natives or the Algerians the natives, the, I mean, it's a pretty rational thing to do, to try and oppose what's being done on you. So the, the violence then comes initially from the settler. So settler colonialism is difficult for a progressive young unionist. But it's a tool that's used all around the world. It explains Algeria, it explains Australia, America, Argentina. They don't like to use it here, but it explains the north of Ireland too. So, yes, people don't like it because, well, it really means the focus should no longer, shouldn't be on the rebels, the IRA. The focus should be on the settlers and the policies of London. What, what's the cause of all this? And hence, we get this problem about rewriting the past, which is a bugaboo for all of unionism. Well, Pat, thanks for coming along today. That was a fascinating insight into the parallels between Ireland and Algeria and on the whole subject of media distortion of our conflict here. And that's it for another week. Don't forget to share the link to today's programme to help us grow our audience across all our social media platforms. In the meantime, the conversation will be back next week with more investigations and analysis. Until next time, I'm Donnie Marson and this has been The Conversation. Bye for now.